I guess the way that uh, we all hooked up with each other is that uh, a few months ago I published an article about Jewish pirates. Um, and the timing could not be better because, um, as you know, it's, it's, it's now the Rosh Hodesh for Adar, which means the Purim is just around the corner, and you're all looking for ideas of things to get dressed up as for Purim, and we're going to solve your problems tonight because the answer, of course, is going to be um, that everybody has to get dressed up as a Jewish pirate. Um, so, what about Jewish pirates? What does that have to do with Jewish genealogy? Um, let me also point out that almost everything that I'm going to tell you is not original. Uh, very little of this is my own original work or, or original um, research. Uh, I'll tell you the moment who did most of the, of the work on this. Uh, I basically just liked the topic and I, and I wrote um, an article about it. It was based on other people's, uh, other people's work. So this, we are serious. There, are, there actually were Jewish pirates in the Caribbean, and not just in the Caribbean. Uh, you will not see them in the, in the Disney movies. If you're taking your children or grandchildren to see the different uh, pirate movies, nobody there is Jewish. Nobody's putting on tefillin. Um, but there were Jewish pirates. Um, the most of the work, the, the the serious work that was done on Jewish pirates, was done by a gentleman named Edward Kritzler. Uh, who is a Jamaican Jew. There are Jamaican Jews. Uh, he was born in Jamaica. Um, curiously, two nights ago, um, if you have at home on, on cable television, the History Channel, uh, there was a show about pirates, and he was the star of the show. Uh, they were actually interviewing him. I think they must have chosen him because they knew I was going to speak about his book uh, this evening. Uh, he was standing there in his Jamaican uh, Shabbos t-shirt and sandals, uh, talking about pirates, um, but he's quite serious. He, he wrote a book about the Jewish pirates of the Caribbean. Many of them were in Jamaica, not just in, in Jamaica. Uh, this is the cover um, of his book. He also, um, his day job is, is he leads groups of Jewish tourists um, for trips to see the Jewish pirate coves of Jamaica. He takes them, I guess, to look for buried treasure. Um, <laughs> So he, I think, popularized the idea um, and the history about Jewish pirates, although he actually missed some of them. He picked up uh, most of them. Let's go to the next one. Um, so he, he deserves all the credit for this, and I don't deserve any of the credit. Um, again, he was born and raised in Jamaica. Um, the mixture of Jamaica with Judaism is not as surprising as you might think. We'll see in a little while. Uh, there, there was actually an interesting Jewish history in Jamaica. Um, there's not much left. There is a small Jewish community still left in Jamaica. I think that the main um, Jewish Jamaican is not really Jamaican at all. Um, you might have heard of, there's a popular singer named uh, Matit Yahu. He actually calls himself Matis Yahu. Um, and he sings Jamaican reggae music. Uh, he actually sings psalms in Hebrew put to Jamaican reggae music. So if you ever get a chance to hear him, he, he appears every once in a while in Israel. Uh, he's, he's actually an interesting uh, singer. Um, anyway, other people have also worked on uh, the subject of Jewish pirates, and we'll mention some of them later also. Um, how did the whole subject come, come up? It turns out that um, people were digging in some graveyards, including some Jewish graveyards in the Caribbean, uh, mainly in Kingston, Jamaica, but also in some other places in Bridgetown, uh, the Barbados, and Caracao, and um, in some other places, and they discovered graves of Jewish pirates. How did they know they were Jewish pirates? Well, first, that you can always tell if the grave is of a Jew because it has uh, Hebrew on it or Jewish symbols, and they had they make the same gravestone mixed Jewish symbols with pirate symbols. We'll see. We see some. Some, um, some photos of these in a while, and I think that triggered the interest in Jewish pirates. Um, Cor Corcaro has special importance, first of all, because we have some people here who grew up in Corcaro, uh, but um, Corcaro Cor is also one of the centers for um, Jewish piracy. It's an island near Venezuela. Um, one of the significance is, is that there, once upon a time there was a rabbi uh, the community there who was criticizing his own community's pirates because they thoughtlessly attacked a ship that was owned by a fellow Jew. Fortunately, they did not attack the ship on the, on the Sabbath. 
Um, I personally think that, that having Jewish pirates in the Caribbean would be a very good cure for Hugo Chavez. <laughs> no. Let's go to the next one. Okay, well, here's the first photo. And if you, you can see, <laughs> this is a Jewish gravestone. Um, the, the, in this photo, you can't see the top, but you can see the skull and um, the crossbones. Um, let's go to the next one. Uh, this is the same one from a different angle. Okay, this is a little bit, here you see the skull, the crossbones up here, and it's a little bit hard to see, but there's, there's, there is Hebrew script here. There is another one of the skull and the, and the crossbones. And there's one more. Uh, uh, this, this, this was a Cullen pirate. <laughs> so who are all these pirates? What are they doing here? Where do they come from? Um, the answer is that most of them were, first of all, they were Spartac Jews. Uh, most of them were refugees from Spain or from Port and Portugal or from the communities that were created from the Jews um, who, who were kicked out of Spain and Portugal. And they took to piracy probably for a mixture of different reasons. Um, one obvious reason was it was a good way to get rich um, because the Spanish ships were carrying lots of treasure. But there was also a political reason and even a religious reason. Because we remember these were people who in many cases had personally suffered or their families had suffered. Um, at the hands of the Iberian countries of Spain and Portugal. So this is their way of getting even. Um, some of these had had their own family members killed or injured. Um, so they uh, went into piracy uh, in, in part for ideological reasons. What is interesting is that apparently quite a few of them were religiously observant. So in, in, in the book that I mentioned before, he describes the pirates going out to, to sea to attack the Spanish ships, wearing their talus <laughs> and their, their tefillin. Um, some of them, he claims, um, had um, the galleys, that is the kitchens of, um, of the ships, had kosher kitchens. Have you heard about the Italian? Sorry? Have you heard about the um, I, I'm just quoting his... Um, you may have two things. Have you heard about the uh, your journals. Well, we'll, we'll see. Documents. We'll see. There's there, there's some stark sources. So so <coughs> aside from the grave services themselves, there, there are some other things that we know about these, as we see in a moment. So let's go to the next slide. Um, again, the the, the 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 motives for a mixture of um, desire for booty plus uh, political motivations. Uh, there, there apparently were some differences between the Spanish Spartac pirates and the French Spartac, Spartac pirates. There were pirates who either came from France, um, as you probably know, the western part of France had some Spartac uh, communities, <coughs> such as in Bordeaux, uh, and in some of the, the French possessions. Um, some of the pirates came from Haiti and from other islands in, in, the, Car in the Caribbean. So apparently, uh, at least this is what he claims, that the, the, the French Sephardic pirates were more into it into for the money, whereas the Spanish uh, were more into it for uh, kind of taking advantage, taking revenge on the Spanish and Portuguese powers. Um, so here, here are some stories of some of the more famous pirates. Uh, the book by Kritzer is just one of the sources. There are other sources um, who speak about these. Uh, the first is Moses Cohen Henrique. Um, first of all, he spent much of his time um, sailing uh, Dutch, a Dutch pirate ships. Uh, he sailed with Admiral P. Tyne of the Dutch West India Company, um, and he specialized in raiding Spanish ships uh, off the coast of Cuba. These were ships that were taking gold and silver from South and Central America back to their home countries. They were easy pickings. Um, and um, the, 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 apparently there was one particularly large raid that they conducted off Montanzo's Bay in Cuba where they managed to grab large amounts of gold and silver. Um, one of the interesting things about uh, this, this gentleman is that he later set up his own Jewish treasure island. It was quite literally an island um, that he was, was run. Um, it was, there's basically a Jewish community on the island. Um, and this island, uh, there are some legends that he buried some of his treasure there, like um, in, in, in the pirate movies. 
One of the significances of this island is the Jews from this island went off to found other Jewish communities, and one of the Jewish communities that was founded in part by the Jewish pirates who came from his treasure island is a little town uh, that was once called New Amsterdam, and it's now called New York. So New York itself has, as some of its <coughs> Jewish roots, um, <coughs> the treasure island. <coughs> He was also an advisor for Henry Morgan. Henry Morgan is probably the most famous pirate in pirate movies. Um, in fact, the show that was, I mentioned, it was on the History Channel two nights ago, was mainly on Morgan. Uh, Morgan basically set up his own, an entire city for pirates. It was one of the best planned cities in the New World with the straight avenues and, and sewers. Um, and so Moses was his Jewish, uh, his Jewish advisor. <coughs> Um, what became of the money um, that he took from the Spanish galleons? Um, probably most of it just disappeared, or we don't know where it is. Um, some of it was used to bankroll other Jewish communities in the New World. One of them was received in Brazil. Um, some of them were used in, in the West Indies. Um, and some of them in, in North America. Okay, number two. Um, <coughs> This is, this is the, literally a pirate rabbi. This was a rabbi who became a pirate, a real rabbi. Rabbi Samuel, I guess you pronounce it, Palash. Um, he, he was an interesting guy. He was, he, he was technically born in The Hague. Um, but he, he spent most of his youth um, in Morocco. His own father was also a rabbi, but a rabbi who would come from Cordoba. I think his, rabbi, his father perhaps was expelled from um, Spain, from Cordoba. So that somehow they ended up in Morocco. Later they connected with, with, with Holland. Uh, so the, the Moroccan sultan sent him to Holland as his own uh, envoy. While he was in Holland, he became personal friend of Prince Maurice. Prince Maurice was the son of the head of government in Holland at the time. Um, basically, they were all pirating together. Uh, so Palash set up his own ships, his own pirate ships. M many of his crews were taken from Moranos, from Anosid, um, from crypto Jews, from various uh, communities. Um, and he, and in those days, uh, a pirate would get letters of mark. A letter of mark is basically a license to be a pirate. And um, the letters of mark were issued either, usually either by Holland or by Britain. In his case, he got um, a Dutch letter of mark and set off with a, um, a Dutch flag to raid, um, raid the Spanish ships. <coughs> okay. Um, <coughs> Subatol de Ul. I guess that's how you pronounce it. And this was another Jewish, Jewish pirate. Um, and... <coughs> He actually operated mainly in the Pacific Ocean, on the Pacific coast of South America. Um, and in particular, he, he collaborated with a gentleman named Henry Drake. Now, just to remind you who, who all these people are, if you remember the story of the Spanish Armada and the, the war between Spain and, and Queen Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth's right-hand man was Sir Francis Drake. He had a son who was pirate. That was Henry Drake, and, and Henry Drake teamed up with his Jewish uh, collaborator. Um, together they set up the Black, Fra the Black Flag Fraternity, which was basically a social organization or an economic organization of pirates in the Pacific that were raiding um, Spanish ships. Um, they supported one another. They provided supplies uh, to one another. There were, there were actual reports. These are not... These are not just rumors, these were at least written reports, that the two of them um, buried treasure together on an island uh, near uh, Coquimbo in 1645. Um, and this, this gentleman is the focus of a different book, not the Chrysler book that I began with. There's a, a book entitled Piracy and Plunder, Murderous Business, written by Milton Meltzer. He's got a whole chapter on this Jewish pirate. Um, some other Jewish pirates. Um, first of all, the, the Jewish pirates did not operate only in South America and in the Caribbean. There were also Jewish pirates operating in the Mediterranean. Um, some of these were working for the Ottomans. The Ottoman, they were working for the Ottomans because the Ottomans, for a long period of time, the Ottoman Empire was at war with the Spanish 
Empire. Um, one in particular was a gentleman known as, C I guess, Sinan, um, at least that's what the Spanish uh, called him, and his nickname was the Great Jew. Uh, he was a pirate born in Anatolia, in what is now Turkey, uh, and then he moved to uh, his pirate operations to Algiers. If you remember your history books, the Barbary Coast, the original Barbary Coast, not the one in San Francisco, um, the original Barbary Coast is North Africa. Um, in fact, the Americans might remember um, Thomas Jefferson sent off some ships to attack the pirates there because they were uh, plundering American ships. That was later. In any case, he, he operated out of, out of Algiers. Um, he, for a while, he was the second in command for the famous pirate Barbarossa. Um, now, there's no connection between Barbarossa. There's, there's also Barbarossa in the Disney movie, and he, he's made pretend, but there was a real Barbarossa who was a pirate, and he had a, he had a Jewish second in command, except the Jewish second in command later went off um, independently. And um, they, they, they had their own pirate flag, but it wasn't the Jolly Roger. <laughs> it was a six-pointed star. Um, and um, which the Ottomans referred to as the Pirate Seal of Solomon. Um, in those days, there was an alliance between Genoa. Remember, Italy was not a, a country. It was just a bunch of smaller states. Uh, Genoa and, and Spain. Uh, were allied together, and they were the plunder of, of, the, Jew, of the pirates, the Jewish pirates and the non-Jewish pirates um, of the Mediterranean. At one point, he, he, this is sort of interesting to think about, he conquered Tripoli in Libya. Tripoli in Libya was conquered by a Jewish pirate, um, and then later he became the supreme Ottoman uh, naval commander. He's apparently buried in a Jewish cemetery in Albania, from which we learned there are Jewish cemeteries, or at least one in Albania, which is another interesting little twist to this. <laughs> um, another pirate was named Yaakov Coriel. Cor uh, he was in, in charge of three pirate ships in the Caribbean. And, I, and what's special about him is he be, became one of the students of the Ari in in, in spots. So he, he, he's basically one of the original Kabbalists. Um, began his life as a pirate, but made Shuba and became a rabbinic student. Um, and he was, so he was one of the original uh, students, and apparently he's buried in spot. I haven't checked this, but he's buried close to the Ari's grave. Okay, David Abrabanel. Um, we're, we're not exactly sure how he connects with the other of Rabbanels, but you, you're probably familiar with the name because there was a rabbinic dynasty in Spain. There, were quite, there actually more than one rabbi of Rabbanels. Uh, so I suspect that he's from their, their, fa their uh, family. Um, his own family was killed by the Spanish while they were on a boat that was attacked near South America. Um, so in revenge, he joined British pirates and again, a leader of the British pirates. He called himself Captain Davis. He named his ship the Jerusalem. And one thing that is interesting, although it's probably not true, uh, there, I, I saw one report on the internet that he actually discovered Easter Island. Um, <laughs> well, it wasn't called Easter Island back then, but um, the, most history books attribute this to someone else. Um, I think that probably proves that it wasn't him, because you're right, it would be called Passover Island. Um, you were asked before where these sources for all these things come from. One, one of the sources is a museum in, in Chile. There's a museum of maritime affairs or something like that. And there are quite a few documents written in Hebrew by the Jewish pirates. Um, so that, that's one source of where all this comes from. Um, just to go back a little bit older, uh, there, 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 there's a longer history of uh, Jewish piracy. It goes back even before the period of the Sephardic pirates who were attacking the Spanish ships. First of all, um, the Seleucids, that is to say, the Greeks that we fought in, in Hanukkah, uh, spent a lot of time complaining about uh, the pirates. Apparently they complained both about Jewish and Arab pirates, both of whom were in the Mediterranean. Uh, one of the leaders of the, the, the Hashemunaim, the, the, the Maccabee family, um, was apparently a, a pirate. The books by Josephus 
describe Jewish pirates. Um, the center for Jewish piracy um, was Haifa. In fact, one of the interesting questions historically is why did Akko become the major port for northern Israel and not Haifa? I mean, in a sense, Haifa has these natural advantages. And the explanation seems to be that there were too many pirates in Haifa that used the Carmel, because the Carmel's got all these little cave, well, caves and little nooks and crannies that they could hide in. Um, so Haifa itself never, until modern times, did not really develop into um, a serious uh, port. Um, it, there were so many pirates, it was known as Little Malta, because Malta was another, another center for the the pirates, and then of course, uh, I live in Haifa, so the, the joke is that the local pirates these days are uh, computer computer software pirates. Um, one other twist to this is that we know that there is a long history of cartography, that is, drawing maps. I mean, today you can, draw, you can download a map from, from Google to the internet, but historically, it's not, it's not a trivial matter with primitive technology to prepare maps. So, cartography was a Jewish specialty. Um, <coughs> we know that Columbus used a book of maps that was prepared by a Jewish uh, cartographer. Uh, Vasco da Gama, he's the first guy to sail around Africa, used, uh, used maps. And there were also Jewish navigators on some of the early um, ships of exploration. OK, back to, back to Jamaica. <coughs> we know that the first Sephardic Jews arrived in Jamaica in 1511. Um, some of them took up piracy, apparently not all of them took up piracy. They lived there <coughs> under um, um, Spanish and Portuguese rule until 1655. In the year 1655, there was an admiral, a British admiral named William Penn. It's not the same William Penn who set up Philadelphia. I'm from Philadelphia. Uh, so that's, that's his son. So the Philadelphia William Penn had a father who was an admiral, and he took the island away from Spain for the British. When he took the island away from Spain, um, actually there, there are some reports that the local Jews in Jamaica were assisting the British to kick out the Spanish. Spain. Uh, some of the Jews had been leave, living as secret Jews. Apparently they came out openly um, and living as Jews. And the Jewish population increased. By 1720, 20% of the residents of Kingston, Kingston, Jamaica, um, were Jews. So the, the, I mentioned earlier these Jewish tombstones, including the pirate tombstones. Uh, some of these go back to 1672. <coughs> and the inscriptions on them were a mixture of Portuguese, Hebrew, and then English inscriptions. Um, later, Ashkenazi Jews arrived in, in Jamaica. Um, and one of the interesting things is that the, the, just like in the United States, the Irish became policemen, and the Chinese opened restaurants, and the Jews became tailors, but in this part of the world, the Jews went into politics. So there was a significant portion of the Jamaican parliament that consisted of Jews, and in fact, <clears throat> until, modern, until Israel was created, it was the only parliament in the world that did not hold deliberations on Saturday. Um, the Knesset also does not hold deliberations on Saturday, and our goal should be to prevent them from holding deliberations on the other days as well. <laughs> we love that. Well, if you're interested, there's a, um, a website on the Pirates of Jamaica. This is run by the official um, Jewish community of Jamaica, so you can, if you want to later, you can make a note of that. Ah, okay, Th this is the most famous, most famous pirate of all. Um, I was trying to arrange the, um, the PowerPoint presentation so it would make like a drum roll. Um, but <clears throat> first of all, um, the Americans among you have all heard of Jean, Jean Lafitte. The others perhaps have not. Uh, but Jean Lafitte, first of all, is one of the most famous pirates of history. Um, he, he was famous, among other things, because he saved the United States in the Battle of New Orleans. There was a war between the United States and Britain. Britain tried to reconquer the United States in 1812. At the, toward the end of the war, there were the critical battle was the Battle of New Orleans. In the Battle of New Orleans, uh, the general of the battle was Andrew Jackson, who later became president of the United States. Uh, if you have any $20 bills at home under the mattress, that's his picture on the $20 bill. Um, and he won the battle largely thanks to Jean Lafitte. 
Um, Julian Fink is also the hero of lots of pirate movies. He was a French-speaking Jew. Sorry, he was a French-speaking pirate, and he was an id. He was, he was one of us. He was a, a Sparta Jew. How do we know? Well, we know from a lot of different things. So, some, one of the articles that traced back his ancestry and reported his ancestry appeared uh, three years ago, almost three years ago, in the Jerusalem Post. It was written by Edward Lick, um, whose son grew up with me in Philadelphia. I think he's a retired professor of political science. Uh, he's one of the sources. Another source is a book by Rabbi Harold Sharpman, Jews on, on, on the Frontier. What we know is that Lafitte, oh, this is not well known, I mean, every child in the United States grows up learning about the great hero Jean Lafitte, but nobody knows that he's Jewish. Um, we know that he was actually a, a Sparta Jew. We're not sure where he was born. And according to some reports, he was, he was born in Bordeaux, which had, a, as I said, a Sephardic uh, community. Uh, other reports say that he was born in Haiti. We know his wife came from, um, the Denmark had some islands in the Caribbean at the time. She was also uh, Sephardic. And um, these are some character truths of, of him. Um, basically, his, his story goes like this. He was pirate. Um, and at the time that uh, the Americans were fighting against the British around New Orleans, the area around New Orleans is swamp, swamp land. Um, and the, the British contacted him because he, he would ordinarily go through the swamps to hide his loot and to raid, uh, to raid ships. Um, since he knew his way through the swamps, the British paid him money to guide their troops through the swamps in order to attack the Americans from behind and take New Orleans, then hoping to win the war. Well, he took their cash, but then he double-crossed them. He just didn't show up to lead them into battle. And as a result, the Americans won. Uh, meanwhile, he, he knew their battle plans, so he transferred their battle plans to General Jackson. Uh, so he double-crossed the British. Uh, as a result, there was a large national park Outside of New Orleans, this is a, supposed to be the, um, the entrance sign, known as the Jean Lafitte National Park, now National Battleground Park. Um, I think it's the only park in the world named for a Jewish pirate. Um, <laughs> and these are some characteristics of what he was supposed to have looked like. Um, what we also know about him is that after he finished saving Andrew Jackson, he set up his own little kingdom um, on the island of Galveston, Texas. At the time, Texas did not yet belong to the United States. It, was, it belonged to Mexico, uh, which in turn belonged to, to Spain. So he set up his own little kingdom there. He called it Campeche. Um, his sidekick was a Portuguese Jew living there named... Do you want to pronounce this for me? Yeah. <laughs> According to some documents he got behind, one of his clients was Jim Bowie. Now again, Jim Bowie, particularly Americans, everybody, Bowie, the, Bowie. the first of the Bowie knife, and the Alamo. The, remember the, the famous battle of the Alamo? He was the hero of the Alamo. If you've seen the movie, there he is with Davy Crockett and with his knife. Um, and he was, he, 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 John Wayne. Um, and he apparently, I don't know if he got his knife from um, Lafitte, but he got his other supplies uh, from Lafitte. And then Lafitte left behind a diary. Apparently, after all of this, he ended up in Europe. While he was in Europe, he met Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels, who were working on their communist, um, the Communist Manifesto. So he suggested to them that they might find it interesting to go have a conversation with Abraham Lincoln. This was his proposal. Um, and instead, they didn't. Okay, so modern piracy. Um, first of all, you all remember the story of 1969 of the, um, the Israeli patrol boats that were stolen from Cherbourg, France. The French had sold these ships to, to Israel. They were refusing to turn them over because Israel had the chutzpah of winning uh, the Six-Day War. So the, the Israelis went in and they stole them. Modern, modern piracy. <laughs> or they, they liberated them. They liberated them. Um, my own personal experience with piracy, I used to, I used to work in uh, my Army Reserve service was at the Navy, and every time I would go to the Navy Reserves, I would always take with me my own supplies 
of candy bars and toilet paper, and they were always plundered. <laughs> <laughs> There's still piracy. There's, there's still piracy. Ah, okay, so now we're getting silly. Um, th there's a website uh, known as the Bang It Out blog that has, has raised a series of halachic questions for Jewish pirates. These are important rabbinic uh, questions. Uh, so here I, I, I took out the ones I thought were the funnier ones. Um, if you have a hook instead of a hand, like Captain Hook, um, on which arm do you put to fill it? Important question. Um, does your, uh, it's hard to read. Does your treasure map show, show how far the robe, ex a robe extends around um, your buried treasure so you know how far you can carry your buried treasure on, on, on Shabbat? If you capture a Spanish plunder ship, how long do you have before you have to put a mezuzah on the, on the captains? <coughs> um, if you have a talking parrot, do you have to sit and worry about the parrot speaking Lashon Hara? Um, do you have to clean out the chabets from your buried treasure before Passover? Uh, when you send the Shema, do, do you cover you, the eye that has the eye patch? Um, and do, are you not aware what leather boot boot of your pig leg on Yom Kippur? Of course, the biggest halakha problem of all, if you're a Jewish pirate, when you get dressed up as on forum? <laughs> An economics professor. <laughs> Now, in the United States, there is a rock and roll group uh, that sings what's known as Gangsta Rap. Gangsta Rap is this hip hop, I, I, I hesitate to call it music, but loosely speaking, it's music. Um, and there's a group called Steve Lieberman and the Gangsta Pirate Rabbi. Uh, so he claims to be um, a Jewish pirate rabbi, and so you can see some pictures of him. And he sells his records. If you're interested, that's his, um, that's his email address. Okay, next. Ah, now, the United States has declared that September 19th every year is the International Talk Like a Pirate Day. <laughs> now, what's interesting is that they don't mean Ladino, although we now know that um, the pirates were speaking Ladino. There exist now pirate opans. You can go to a pirate opan. Um, there's a pirate dictionary. Um, and here are just some, some, some images from the, from the internet. Um, and so you should, of course, um, be prepared for next September. Um, okay. So finally, yo ho ho the bottle of Benashevitz. Um, um, put the oi back into the ohoi. Um, just call me Blackbeard, or in my case, Greybeard. Um, these, these, of course, should, should be the, the slogans of the Jewish pirates. Okay. Um, if you have questions.